It was 6.30 a.m. My dad had just dropped me off. I scurried to take my place on a green bench. On that green bench, half of the 40 people were African American. Half were Caucasian. For some, it was their full-time job. Others, it was a way to make a second living. For me, it was a way to earn money to go to college. I was in the third year of a journey. I was sitting on a bench on a William Flynn golf course. 36 holes in the suburbs of Philadelphia at an all-Jewish country club. It was Philmont. And when my name was called, I'd go scurrying. Can you remember those days of the big, white Wilson bags? They rode like a pack horse. And at five feet, 105 pounds in ninth grade, I always ran for the McGregor bags, the big straps they rode so smoothly on your shoulders. Well, this particular day, I had Joe Strauss, Bobby Blumenthal, who was at RCA, Cy Golden, a Cadillac dealer, Bobby Mitchell. When we finished the second hole here at Philmont, Joe Strauss had dumped the ball in the water. He was three over after two. And as we were leaving the green, walking up that steep hill to the third hole, he looked at me and said, I don't have it. I just don't play like I used to. I'm really struggling with my game. And I looked at Mr. Strauss and I said, sir, you're a really good player. You've got a really good game. You've got some great tempo. Let's just go have some fun. If we can make a couple of birdies, these guys you're playing against are going to fold. And he looked at me and he turned and he said, let's go get them. By the time we reached the 16th hole, when he chipped in from the back of the green to a left center pin position, he was dancing like Tiger Woods did here at Beth Page in his heyday 15 years ago. That day, he shot the finest round of his life, 69. And that began a journey because as I sat on a bench, the pro came to me and said, never give a lesson to a member again. And at 15 and not wanting to get fired, I said, yes, sir. But let me help me understand my role. My role is to help carry the bags. It's helped to be the cheerleader of my player. It's helping him, like all of you do every day, create entertainment and help him play the finest round of his life. Here I stand, 46 countries later, 2.6 million miles traveled. I've seen over 4,000 of the 33,331 golf courses in the world. Some view that as my strengths. In a book that was just released, some would call me the micro in terms of creating astute insights that produce awesome results. So today, you're Joe Strauss. Today, I'm going to be your caddy, and I'm going to present to you a study and a formula that if you follow in 2015, I'm confident you're going to have the best results at your golf course. Now, you're all from New York. Your arms are crossed. You're skeptical, and you're going, oh, wait a second here. There's lots of crosswinds in the golf industry. What are those headwinds? Let's identify them, and let's address what those headwinds are because I don't believe that they're ultimately the barriers. All of you say, oh, we have way too many golf courses. We need less golf courses. And on a national basis, that's true. In the next 10 years, 10% 10 of the industry should shrink to reach an equilibrium. We talked about weather with David and its impact on your operation. We talk about technology and the internet mandate. Some are checking the iPhones, the cell phones, everything that's going on. How do we keep pace? What's going on with the time crunch culture? When we do surveys, what do everybody say the number one challenge is? Either they're playing as much as they want to, or they don't have enough time. How do you overcome that? And then if you look at your expenses, water, electricity, fertilizer, labor benefits, you collectively would be viewed as though you're behind the eight ball, right? There's nothing you can do. Just hang on. Well, let's see if we can reach some agreements here. 
and facts in the industry, and then build a model that if you implement next year, you're going to have the best results ever. Fact one. The basic business model for golf is flawed. Only 60% of golf courses in the country today can cover operational cost. And that when you look at that, less 20% can cover capital costs. The $200,000 a year should be put aside for capital improvements. When a course like Cherry Hills, where it's just had the BMW championship in the last 10 years has assessed $20,000 a member, if a course like Cherry Hills has to assess to make it, what are your chances? David? Odds are stiff, aren't they? Very. Fact number two. Because of the challenges you face, the average employee behind the counter, how many times have you gone to a golf course and said, wow, that person behind the counter was so friendly, that was the greatest experience? Because what's unfortunate is you were the brains behind the golf industry throughout the metropolitan area. You create the vision. You determine the resources. But what happens? The lowest paid workers are the ones that create the experience with your golfers. And so they become frustrated. No one's had a great behind the counter of experience. Fact number three, are there any municipalities in the room? My hearts go out to you, Richard. You deal with a city council where maybe one or two out of all a city council plays. It's viewed as a rich sport. They've got all kinds of resources they have to allocate elsewhere. And that your ability to get an audience, that they emasculate you as a businessman from performing at your best. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Challenge. So, there was a study done, and I love this expression. In the beginner's mind, there's many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. And that there is a system by which if you run your golf course. In 2010, I published a book called The Business of Golf, What Are You Thinking? I love the title because it's the double entendre. I immediately got a call from Rick Lucas, the head of the PGA, the PGM program at Clemson University, who said, Jim, I like this book. I want to put this book into my curriculum. But I need a case study. I need to test back the questions. The second semester, he said, Jim, this went really, really well. But I want to see if this works in the field. I want my students to go take these principles and apply them. So at the Trails at Chickasaw, at the end of the semester, the dean of the university and the board of directors of the Trails at Chickasaw met, and they were stunned by the results from following a simple seven steps that each one of you can apply today. And then he said, Jim, I got my master's, I want a PhD, and all I need to do is write a dissertation. Here's the title of his dissertation. And he said, Jim, can you go find some golf courses across the country that are going to test this system and see if, in fact, it is a system that will work to improve the financial performance of golf facilities. So Rick and I sat down and we created some assumptions. You are all working too hard on the wrong things that make little difference. There has to be key measurements that determines whether your course is going to be a success. Would you intuitively put a Lamborghini dealership into a slum? No. Do you know in Atlanta, Georgia, you cannot find a Starbucks south of I-20 or inside of 285? Where your golf course is, location, 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 largely determines the financial potential of your golf course. Weather forecasting. How many of you use really weather forecasting and rely on it? The answer is no one in the golf industry. There has to be a way that we can use weather forecasting to our advantage, not on a historical basis, but on a forecasting basis. And you all adopt technology just based on templates from cyber golf or one-to-one -one marketing, but are they really what the golfer wants or needs? You're creating static information. Benchmarking. You heard Jay said that they're going to create databases. Well, there, there has to be a way that you could all compare your financial performance. How do you fly a plane without controls? How do you drive a car? What about the capital reserves? What should they be? And that the courses operate, you all operate with, oh, we've got a lot of loyal golfers. I would argue that your golfers, all because they come frequently, doesn't necessarily mean they're loyal. And that third parties, GolfNow.com, Tioff, are lowering their rates and they're making it more challenging than ever for you to be successful in the business, right? So Rick and I developed a model and we said that with the course rating between 115 and 124, 75% of all the golfers come within 10 miles. 
The median household income within most cities is between forty-five and sixty-five thousand dollars. The typical age and ethnicity: there are sixteen hundred to two thousand golfers per eighteen holes. There's one thousand seven hundred and thirty-seven golfers per eighteen holes in America. In the major metropolitan areas like New York, there's two thousand six hundred and forty golfers per eighteen holes. So where do you stand in terms of supply and demand? And then we said that when we look at courses, and if we go beyond demand exceeds supply, if you're in a major metropolitan area, or if you've got a course where your slope rating's higher, or you've got bent grass greens and fairways and a short game facility and a grass teeing area, that adds additional value, right? And what about if you've got ambience and you're on the ocean and mountains? That's a difference where you could get and charge more money. So in looking at this, we said there are factors that go into this because everything you ever bought in your life, Every time a golfer comes to your golf course, he makes a decision. What did I pay? What was my experience? And did I get value? Every morning when I'm in Castle Pines, Colorado, at somewhere between 8 and 9, I start the work at 5.30 in the morning, I go get a Starbucks and pay 4.22. Is it worth 4.22? For me, it's a 15-minute break to go say hi to some people, so I get value there. Because the formula is, if the, the experience equals or exceeds the price at your golf course, you're going to become f prosperous. But if you charge more, how many golfers would play Beth Page at $1,000 around the black course? Maybe once in their life. What's the right price that determines the value here at the golf course? So we said, the only ability you have to create that experience is, what's your net income? Or what are you willing to bet? Invest. And every time you want to invest, you have to go to the general fund and get some money and maybe float a bond. All kinds of hurdles there to get that done. Same thing with Andy in terms of the hurdles he faces. So we said, there's got to be a way of looking at a golf course. What's a slope rating? Determines the maintenance budget. And it also factors into the slope of play. Of course, it's 145 slope rated. Is it going to play the same pace of play as one that's 113? The answer is no, it's not. And that once you know the maintenance budget and the pace of play, it creates the experience. It determines the golfer that's going to go play, how many first-time golfers go play TPC Sawgrass, and have fun, <laughs> none, which then determines your ability to charge the green fee. And we found some interesting correlations that if you tell me your budget, your green fee should equal 0.001% of your maintenance budget. $450,000 is $45 green fee. What's the average municipal budget in the country? It's $450,000. Private clubs are $650,000 for a maintenance budget. There may be other factors. We also noted that the median household income, 53214 in the United States, correlates. So if we're in an area of town within five miles that the household income is $90,000, what would that suggest? We've got greater propensity. We could charge more money. So we said there has to be a belief and that the formula that we came up with was based on the why, how, what video with Simon Sinek. Why, David, am I going to go play your course versus Richard's course? You both have 18 holes, 18 tees. You have a hamburger, a hot dog, Coke, beer. There, what's the difference between your two courses? Why am I going to play one versus the other? People don't buy what you have. They buy why you do it. People come here to Beth Page to play the black because of the open, its history, the championship, Tiger Woods. Why do they go play your course? Jeffrey. Cheap. <laughs> Which may answer it. And so your slope rating is probably between 113 and 118 to 120. There's formulas here that it all works and comes together because people buy. And this is if you do nothing else, go watch the TED Talk Why, How, What by Simon Sinek. It's fabulous. Because what people do is they buy what you do, they don't buy why you do it. They buy why you do it, they don't buy what you have. They buy why you do it. If I say TPC Sawgrass, if I say Pine Valley, there's a why. It's different, it's unique. What we wanted to make sure that the study, that there was a hope for the golf industry. There's all kinds of people saying it's going to crash, it's going to fall. Well, look at these numbers just posted by the NGF in terms of the millennials versus everybody in this room by and large, is that the 18 to 30, 20 years ago played maybe 2.1 more rounds. Is that that significant? And if we look at the senior citizens today that play 31 rounds versus 28 to 20 years ago, that's not that significantly different either. The NGF just released a study last week. Do you know what the average age of a golfer is in America today? 
45.4 years of age with a household income of $91,900. And what's scary, if you go back to the 2002 study of the NGF, it's up from 85,000. The average income of a golfer has increased $6,000 in the last two years. And what's really scary is the age two years ago was 43. <laughs> the industry's gone two years longer and it's aged two years more. But we said, Rick, wait a second here. Golf is a sport that when you're 20 and 30 and you're now doing the muddy butters and you're doing the triathlons and you're doing the swimming and you have that competitive venue. What are you gonna do when you turn 35 and you've gotten married and you have kids? Are you gonna continue to rock climb with two kids at home and a wife or a husband taking the kids to soccer? The answer is no. That golf is the venue for those, it's the entry door we maintain is when they become 30 to 35 is the entry door for the game of golf on a long-term fiscally sustaining basis. And if you look at the population, look at the number of millennials. They're gonna be coming into the golf industry soon. And that we think the industry, well, is gonna change from traditional to casual. 80% historically has been traditional. Athletic competition, elitism, high private clubs. We think it's gonna be casual. Hats on backwards, cell phones. I've got a friend, Mike Lodge, lost a lot of digital caddies. He's putting TV sets in golf carts that you can literally watch the football games while you're playing. And to youth, total cost is free because he's got Sprint providing the advertising in the carts. So if we look at this as the game and where we're going, we said, Rick said, we got to test this. So I got Catherine Jemsek at Cog Hill, Steve Freelander at Pelican Hills, Jim Roshak, City of San Antonio, Dale Radcliffe in Carolina, Brad Dean up in Michigan at Crystal Mountain, Peter Ayala at Fernie BC, Don Berry at Edinburgh one, USA, a top 100 golf course. And they all tested these templates to say, if we literally executed these templates in these seven steps, what would the difference be? And here's the results of the study that we're sharing with you today. There are six numbers that define the potential of the facility. If you give me these six numbers, I, I will guess your gross income within $100,000. And I know you're skeptical because there's a mosaic profile. And what's that mosaic profile rating? Because if it's not high enough, you have no chance. If you're a minus 20 in the mosaic profile, and if your income in the area, think $31,000, Tallahassee, Florida, 52% African American, those two numbers, what do you think the Florida State University golf course makes? They lose two and a half million dollars. If the age in ethnicity, if the age in Sarasota, Florida is 51.2 years of age with a household income of $40,000, $40, what do you think those golfers want? High-end private club, expensive initiation fee? No, they want season passes at the four courses of Bobby Jones. High volume, low cost. That's the market for Sarasota. We looked at the golfers per 18 in terms of the demand and the adjustments that could happen and saying only if that we had high enough income like at Pelican Hills where it's $110,000 median household income, could you command a green fee of $275 or $300 around. And so where are golfers? Golfers tend to be the higher income. They tend to be older. They tend to have, they tend to be uh, Caucasian. For every one round an African American or Hispanic American plays, seven rounds are played by Caucasian. For every one round played by an Asian American golfer, four rounds are played by Caucasians. I'm a statistician. I'm a CPA. I'm fact oriented. So wealth plus older plus Caucasian equals a greater probability they're a golfer. And the greater probability, the higher the disposal income, the higher the green fee you can charge. And the higher the green fee, the higher the maintenance budget, the higher the slope rating. Sorry, David the better the experience. <laughs> <laughs> but it all follows in terms of a logical flow when you put all of this data up here and we said, well, what about the supply and demand? Where we go into an area like a Philadelphia or New York, the demand is so much higher. You can get away with some mistakes. You can charge more money. But what we found is if you have areas of low income, young population, very diverse ethnically, low in terms of golfers per 18 holes, you're going to break even on an EBITDA or you're going to lose a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars. Absolutely positively, I guarantee it, unless there's something unique in terms of being on the ocean or an amenity, that there is a formula in those six numbers. And so you're saying, well, Jim, what's this mosaic profile? Experian takes the 318 million Americans and they put us into 12 categories behind the chart. How many golfers do you think come from low-income elders or metropolitan strugglers? 
The vast majority of golfers are found amongst the families of sophisticated singles, bourgeoisie, prosperity, career, family, and comfortable retirement. That's where our golfers are from. So is your golf course in a neighborhood that has these concentrations? So in the study, we looked at Crystal Mountain Resort. It's a minus 17 mosaic profile within a radius of 10 miles. It's a resort destination that they have to draw from Detroit to be successful. If you look at Don Velmer, you can see it's a minus 7%. That's Florida State University. But look at Pelican Hills. 40% positive rating in terms of career and family. But as they move away to 10 to 15 miles, it starts dropping significantly in that the Pelican Hills local market is for the corporate customer coming on business or for the local golfer within a five mile radius. Look at Eric Leacher, spent $2 million, the USGA, extending the golf course at Western Illinois University, the Harry Macedo Golf Course. Catherine Jemsek at Pine Meadow, look at how strong that golf course is on the north side of Chicago. Would you like to own that golf course? Well, we took these numbers and said, or Cedar Creek, and we took those numbers like Cedar Creek and said, well, let's look at this. The income within five miles of the Alamo is really good. The age is young, high Hispanic, but the slope rating is 132. This doesn't work. It's a finger die span golf course, elevated greens that are going to run off. You have to walk 200 feet down the hill. You got to walk 200 feet up the hill. Is that a place for a family to go play golf? Nope. The clubhouse is a dump. I've said this to Jim Roshak and he agrees. Three miles away at La Cantera, they're getting $125 and he can't get $40 because the clubhouse is inconsistent with the nature of the golf course and the customer he has. If we look at all of these statistics like champions, a fabulous Robert Trent Jones course, but if we look at the income of 41,000 versus 53,000 at Turnberry, less of a slope rating, look at the number of golfers per 18 holes, which golf course is more profitable? Turnberry. If we go look at the Jemsek family, you saw that really good mosaic profile, $87,000 income, but look here that the Jemseks only have 1,525, 24 golfers per 18 holes within the radius of 10 miles of Pine Meadow. They're struggling. These six numbers tell us the probability. Here at Western Illinois University, 742 golfers, age of 28, income of 31,000. I said to the chancellor, I said, he says, we've got this great golf course. I said, you're yeah, really good, but here's what you need to do. In your general fudge bu budget, book a quarter of a million dollars a year lost every year. There's nothing you can do to change the loss. You've built a course in the wrong neighborhood. So you're saying, well, Jim, that's around the world, we're different. We're from New York. Well, let's show you the numbers. So let's look at Beth Page State Park. Look at the number of routine service workers within a five mile radius. This is a sort of a neutral number. But if we go to Nishanik, and I put Nishanik up on the screen in case you're not familiar where it's located, in Morris County, Somerset County, Somerset County. Oh, good number. Within five miles, look at the career and family, 43.6% positive. You'd want a golf course in the Shattuck based on the demographics. Metropolitan Strucklers is 16% less than the general population. I understand somebody's in the audience today from Sterling Farms. Here are your numbers. Plus 26. The bourgeois prosperity that you've got, 33% greater than the rest of the nation. So the basic numbers you've got on surface look good. But when you combine the income at Nishanik is 200% greater than the population and Sterling Farms is 166% and we start lining up these indices and your slope ratings, look what happens in your 10 mile radius at Nishanik. Only 1,240 golfers. It's way oversupplied with private courses. And here at 1550, you're below the national average. So your market is in the five mile area in creating loyalty programs that would really make sense on the surface. Who's the winner? Look at Beth Page, 5,380 golfers, and we're counting not one course, so we're counting five courses. There's 5,380 golf courses within five miles. And if you take the diversity of the slope ratings from the black all the way down to the green, the yellow, the red, it's 126, it's perfect. This is a money-making factory. But we also said there has to be something in terms of controlling weather. Weather Trends International. 
literally forecast for Budweiser. Do you know Budweiser, if it's going to be one degree higher 11 months from now, they make five million more barrels of beer. They already know when the flowers are coming into Home Depot and Lowe's here in New York. They already know when you're going to, grass is going to start growing next spring. All the major corporations use a weather forecasting tool from Weather Trends, and in doing it, this is their accuracy. This, they do in a forecast 11 months out, and you can see the line. They're 88% accurate with respect to temperature and precipitation. They may say it's going to rain heavy in Florida. Two inches? Well, it could be a hurricane. But they will get the event correct. And so we looked at this and said, well, weather changes every year. I already know you had a better 2012 than 13, correct? And your 14 may be a little bit better than 13. Even? Even? We've got three weeks started. Started late three weeks. And it was weather. But look at how the weather changes. Red is warm, blue is cold. This is an accurate predictor, and weather doesn't repeat itself across the United States. And so how do you separate that all out? And then what's amazing to me, they produce golf playable day reports. Here at Beth Page, there's 247 playable days. Now you would think in the metropolitan area in New York, you have the same number of playable days, right? Wrong. Neshanik's only got 242, and it's Sterling Farms. You only have 237 playable days a year. And this measures it. So therefore, you should have had really good 2012s and 13s in relationship to the national average. In 10 and 11, your numbers are probably down. So you've got the ability to forecast and take and go to the owners and say, here was the impact of weather on a per round basis. Well, who's doing this? Well, when we look at the capacity of the courses, this is the chart given to me by Jeff Levine of Century Group. These are every single market they manage. And what they do, you can see the reports from September the 15th, they measure the golf playable rounds. They have the forecast from the departure from average. They know what the rev par is for every one of their golf courses. And they know exactly what the adjustment's going to be in revenue that they send to every one of their owners on a weekly basis, saying based on whether we're going to be up or down this week because of weather. Now think about this. Jeff Levine updates this. He's in charge of the public golf division, uses weather, and leverages it to that extent. I cheated when I said you're going to have the best year next year. Here's your weather forecast for 2015. Your temperature is going to be one to four degrees higher. You're going to have an early spring. So in terms of staffing, maintenance, and that your precipitation levels are going to be OK nationally. So based on this, my prediction is your rounds are going to be up 3% next year. Well, we looked at, they're the uncontrollable factors. What can we do in terms of controllable? Well, technology is underutilized. 98% of all golf course websites are awful. Sorry. And that you've got individuals and groups. And the whole thing is not selling rounds. It's selling what are you getting per round is all that matters. Revenue, rev par. And that if we look at all the ways to book through mobile and text and SEO, well, here's Beth Page's website. Notice what they've done well. Escape, explore, experience. That's their why. You come to Beth Page to escape, explore, experience. They got the phone number. They got the courses. Here's Nishanik. That's the home page. Now, you saw that Nishanik is a really wealthy population. Here's what they have to do to get a tea time. Step one, step two, step three. Is a really wealthy person going to go through these hurdles to be able to get a tea time? No. Because they've got to capture the market within five miles of a wealthy and making it really easy. And then if we look at Sterling Farms, book, golf permits, host. Where's the phone number? I'm from Colorado. I'd like to call you and see how I can get on the course. Why do I want to come play your course? When I say all oh, websites are wrong, it's not my opinion, it's a fact. If a corporation like Hertz, <laughs> if they were to decide, if the golf course industry were to decide a website for Hertz, <laughs> I'd hate to think of what it would look like. What do they have in their upper left hand corner of the page? The ability to book. Why do you go to Hertz? Check your loyalty, book an outing, book a group. Upper left hand corner, how do you read? Left to right, top to bottom. What about Marriott? You want to make a reservation at Marriott? Where is it? 
front and center of their homepage. What are you in the business of? Booking rounds. Most courses, it's three to six clicks before you can even get to take a tea time. United Airlines. This is pretty defining. That if the major corporations of America have got their websites that are transaction oriented, and that who is the best gam gambler that owns a golf course? Billy Walters in Las Vegas. He was featured on 60 Minutes. How does Billy have his site constructed? His three golf courses, Bally High, Upper Left, Best Rate Guarantee, Facebook, Best Rate. And he's got a scrolling banner on the golf courses. Billy's got it right. This course in the middle of nowhere, it's actually in the suburbs of Calgary, create memories worth repeating. Who would like to go play this golf course? Looks good. And what have they done? Right in the middle of the homepage, they got the ability to book a tee time really quickly. And they've also constructed joining a mobile club so that they could know the new entrants, the women that are looking to come. They could know groups and golf, get, get golf ready people. They're defining their database right on their home page by clicking this that they can send tailored emails. I'm always frustrated I get an email to come to a ladies event from San Antonio. It's not applicable. I shouldn't get the email. Because when you get those emails, what do you do? You hit it undelete. So let's, we looked at the websites and there are all these other things. And what we learned in the study is golf courses send out, their t send out the specials or their announcements. They send them out in the afternoon, usually on Tuesday. When's the worst time to send out an email? <laughs> Monday morning. But on a study with 9, million, 9 billion emails by HubSpot, emails should go up between 5 and 6 in the morning, and the best day is on Saturday or Sunday. But because they're playing golf, Wednesday is actually 5 a.m. in the morning is your best time. But nobody in the golf industry does that. If you were to adopt that practice, you're going to change. And so we looked at financial metrics. There are all, nobody's using the benchmarks that are out there. Here's the PGA performance track literally has by nation, by state, by PGA section, by municipal, daily fee, resort, municipal, 50 reports that you probably have two full-time employees in your maintenance department, six to eight seasonal on a maintenance budget of 500,000. You can see where you stand because they break it down by five criteria. And that if we look at PJ Performance Track, we'll show you all of the statistics in terms of how you're doing in your local market and you just merely send, have your pro put in your numbers and you're going to see how you're doing in your red par. The PGA Performance Track already has these statistics in here. Here's the rounds. We're down 1.4% this year. The rounds in the Middle Atlantic area are what 1.3, temperature 3.6 degrees with two precipitations up 2%. All this information is available for you to run your golf course. Do you know that there's a direct correlation between the green fee and the price of the shirt in the golf shop? They should be identical. $45 shirt, $45 green fee. What chance would you have of selling Peter Millar in your golf shop, Jeffrey? Zero. Exactly right. And so this, with all you do is they've got interfaces to all the point of sale systems that you just upload your data and you're going to get this report on what's selling and what's not and are you carrying the right brands. Club benchmarking is unbelievable. They have literally lined up the general ledger of 1,000 golf courses across the United States. Look at the consistency of maintenance as a percent of gross revenue. The reason it's higher in the West is because of water. If we look at the payroll as a percent of operating revenue, where's your payroll as a percent of operating revenue? We've created a template. There's only 30 variables and we can do a five-year cash flow forecast. We know what your average seasonal wage, what the benefit packages are. You overthink it and work on all these extended budgets. And so we looked at facilities and said the golf course is a living organism. There's only 13 things in a golf course. The average golf course needs to put aside $281,000 a year. This template could literally tell you and take to city council what they should have put in their budget. There's only 38 tasks somebody in the maintenance department does. Your maintenance labor hour budgets in Minnesota are 12,000 hours. In Denver, they're 18,000 hours. If you've got maintenance here of over 30,000 hours, you've got way too many. This template literally measures exactly the number of hours that you need, and you can compare it with your actual budget. Your brand is defined by you're in the car manufacturing business. Do you know that? You've got an assembly line. You provide a venue for athletic competition. You provide a venue for friends and family to bond. You provide an office for senior citizens to celebrate their days of old. 
and you provide an office for a businessman to bond and connect to his customers. And you do it on an assembly line of all kinds of customer touch points. So from pre-purchase of word of mouth to email to your websites to purchase of the condition, the course layout, the price, and the brand, to what are you doing in following up on emails with respect to the resolution customer surveys? We just did a survey on how many people in the golf industry do surveys. 88% of the people never have their golf course secret shop. 82% of the industry don't even do a customer survey. How can you serve your customer if you don't know what they want? We've created as part of this study that was tested that we've got, you literally go through each one of the touch points. Do you have a touch tone telephone, train call center, book? You literally go check these 250 and we'll tell you whether you're a steel, bronze, silver, gold, or platinum level golf course in terms of the experience. And that we can go in and based on slope strategy, conditioning, turf texture, ambiance, and amenities, determine what your green fee should be. Think about that. You're creating a very predictable experience they may vary based on a little bit on demand, may vary a little bit based on dem demographics. But if I come play your course, David, I've seen over 4,000 of them. I should be able to know there's an experience there and did I get fair value? We've created a template that will actually measure the fair value. And with respect to customer surveys, I made the point that frequency doesn't equal loyalty and firing your worst customers is a good thing. For every golf course that has a season pass, there's a formula. A golfer should pay about 25% of your playable days and should play at about a 32% discount. If you run those numbers and see what you're charging, in 90% of the cases, season passes are under, under, oversold, undervalued. And you know what's wrong about a season pass? Somebody's mad. If you sell a season pass based on a break point, meaning how many rounds are you going to play at 40, and they play 80, don't you resent him? <laughs> Don't you hate that guy when he comes in for the 80th and 90th round and he's now playing paid you $6 a round? So you're, you lost. Or if the customer paid and said, I'm going to play 40 rounds but only played five, he's gone. That golf course just stole from me. I didn't get my full value. I don't like that golf course. They, they overcharged me. Season passes have, are really a challenge. And so if you don't know this loyalty question on 10 plus 9 on 6, you have to have a plus 26 rating to have a chance. So the question is, does this process work? You're working too hard. You need to figure out your why. You need to know six numbers, mosaic, age, income, ethnicity, golfers, per, uh, 18, and slope. For $300, you can get 11 months of weather forecasting from Weather Trends International. Because if you were to schedule next year's club championship or a big event and you knew that there was a high probability of rain and you could move it the event one week before or after, wouldn't you do that? Everybody should look at their website and say, is it transaction oriented or is it information oriented? And spend over the winter redoing it. Participate in the PGA benchmarking service. Make sure your capital budgets have reserves in them and that you secret shop and survey your golf courses and that you create a third party that identifies the Golf Now customer. Dale Radcliffe in, San, in North Carolina stole 3,640 names, and that's his term, not mine, from Golf Now. And how did he do it? He has every single time that GolfNow.com sells in his T sheet so marked on Easy Links. And when they come in, he says to them, It's great you're here today that you got your time on GolfNow.com. Do you know we have a loyalty program that's actually better than going to get you lower value? Here's a card, just fill it out. <laughs> and he literally, and for your effort, here's a bucket of Rage Balls. Over two years, he picked up 3,640 customer names that he now has made part of the loyalty program that they, and trained away from GolfNow.com. So here's Dale, participating was one of the best moves we made. It was an eye-opening. This is a gentleman that's been on the PGA board. Jim Roshak, 30 years as a course operator, surprised by the participation. The insights are interesting. Brad Dean up at Crystal Mountain. His revenue was up 40,000 in June. His ADR was up $3 by applying these lessons and understanding who his golf course was. So what does this all mean for you? How do you become a winner? You can take the 45 minutes we spent together, take some notes and go for it. A second way is We've got a book for seasoned professionals. It's $200 on Amazon. Just give me a business card. I'll bill you $100 
and it's got all the lessons of what you need to do to become a success. If you want to become a little more detailed in this, we're currently doing, in the fall webinar series, we're doing one in the winter. I currently have courses in Palm Springs, Fairbanks, Alaska. They just closed. They're unhooking their pipes today. Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Virginia Beach are all going through this process. For $7,500, we literally go and create your strategic plan for you, and we do it in a series of eight-hour webinars starting on January the 8th, where we're going to do to give you your detailed local market analysis, your, whether your playable days, your financial benchmarking. We're going to take you through all these steps and all the templates you saw we're going to give to you and we're going to get you all the data you need. Or you could hire NGF Global Golf Advisors ourselves and pay thirty to 75000 So the question is, you could spend 100 7500 or 75000 As a final point, is this a fad? What we've seen in doing this over the couple of years, that if you focus and understand the dynamics of your golf course, if based on that you take action in knowing what that value is creating, and if you're willing to implement and make decisions, you're going to win. What questions can I answer for you? Yes, sir. Surveys, we made this comment coming over here. Everywhere you go, everything you buy, you know, you buy a screwdriver in a hardware store, you know, you get a, get a survey from them. So, what, and I, 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 you know, I guess you can give them a bucket of balls or whatever to try to, um, you know, entice them to fill out a survey. So, specifically on survey, to get customers' <clears throat> input, do you have any general rules of thumb to make them fill out a survey? And what do you feel is the important questions to get, you know, to ask in a survey? And you know, how, many, how many questions should you ask? Because let, let's face it, you're going to get 30 seconds out of the guy. And, so. We just launched a survey a week, last week, City of Virginia Beach. They gave us a database of 19,000 names. 25% of the names bounced. We had 1,437 people respond. We had an 18% 18 open rate, a 12% completion rate. Unbelievable. I just launched a survey on last Thursday to Fort Worth. Uh, we had 937 responses in four days on a database of 8,000. We normally see a 15 to 20% open rate on a survey with a 12 to 15% completion rate. It's unbelievable. And all we're offering them is the opportunity for five foursomes with a cart good through next April. I don't know why. It's a 25 question survey. The first five questions, it's all, the, as a matter of fact, all the questions are in that book. What's your age, income, ethnicity? How often do you play? How many different golf courses? What's your loyalty to a series of golf courses in the area? Then based on seven questions, conditioning, food and beverage, which, how would you rate each of these golf courses? And so you determine who your competitive mix is. How many rounds do you play at these golf courses in the area? So you know, and what's great about this is that by doing that survey, if you see somebody's playing Sterling Farms and I'm competing against Sterling Farms, I got that guy's email address and I'm going to go, wait a second, I'm going to send him. This is a really good customer. He just played 42 rounds at Sterling Farms last year. We just launched the survey on Saturday in Fairbanks, Alaska next Thursday. We're launching San Antonio, Texas. They have a database of 40,000. They're easy to execute, and we can get the response in five days. And you can do it yourself. Just go under vertical response. Based on the size of your database, you'd pay $50, $60. SurveyMonkey, maybe $150 for the subscription just to load the names and just tabulate it. Once a year, a survey is easy to do. And they love to respond. Yes? The uh, presentation you made. Are we doing time? Yes, it is. And the book's available where? Here. And on, if you, here or on our website, and if you do Y50 on the website, it's available here. I bought 10 books. Just give me a card. We can send you an invoice. Um, or you can go to Amazon and pay $200. <laughs> but here it's $100. Or on our website if you use the discount code Y50. Any other thoughts? Hearing none. Thank you.